Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned last week that the U.S. will hit its debt ceiling this Thursday. After that, the Treasury will resort to what she called extraordinary measures to prevent the government defaulting on its debt. What is the debt limit and what happens if it isn't raised? The U.S. spends more money than it takes in with taxes. To cover the difference, the government sells bonds, promising to pay back the buyers with interest in the future. The cumulative size of these obligations is the debt, and the debt limit is the ceiling imposed by Congress on the amount of debt that the U.S. federal government can have at any one time. The debt limit was created to help fund the First World War. More recently, it has occasioned debates about government spending, just as the arrival of a credit card bill might initiate a discussion of household spending. But just like the arrival of a credit card statement, the bill is due now. The ceiling must be lifted not to fund future spending, but to cover what the government has already spent. A credit card company doesn't care if you spent too much on clothing, they just want to get paid. Bondholders don't care that the U.S. spent too much on national defense or COVID-19 or Social Security. They want the U.S. to keep its promises. If the U.S. does not, economists of both parties expect pain similar to the last time. The U.S. even flirted with not raising the limit. Stocks plunged and the cost of borrowing for business jumped as the global economy reacted to the idea of a risky future where the United States, the most stable economy in the world, flaked on its obligations. Since 1960 alone, Congress has acted nearly 80 times to raise or extend the other or otherwise revise the debt limit. During that time, it's been changed 49 times under Republican presidents and 29 times under Democratic ones. Let's bring in former Treasury Secretary Jack Lew, who served during the Obama administration and who has had to keep these plates spinning uh, at a professional level. Um, so when you were Secretary of the Treasury, you, what does it mean to take extraordinary measures? So when uh, you hit the debt limit, um, it sounds like that's the end and you can't do any more. But it turns out there are some uh, devices, bookkeeping devices, that can be used to extend the time. They're called extraordinary measures because until the 1990s, nobody had ever done them. They're now done so routinely that it's just part of the lead up to running into the debt limit. So they're not as extraordinary as they used to be. They're not great, but they don't have real consequence. Do they... But at some point, they might. So, so the initial ones you do, if you explained it, it would take you 10 minutes. But then at some point, you could run into yeah. not paying Social Security checks. Well, the, the, that's beyond extraordinary measures. Okay. That, that's once you've hit the, really hit the ceiling. Okay. Um, the extraordinary measures uh, are things like not investing uh, government uh, uh, employee contributions into, into the retirement funds, uh, things where you can catch up later and make everyone whole. Um, there's only a few devices like that. The letter that Secretary Yellen sent out is the beginning of the process. And in that letter, she indicated, as you have to, a rough estimate of when that will run out. You don't really know how long the runway is. Uh, for example, on April 15th or April 17th, when people pay their taxes for last year, uh, the government will know much more clearly how much uh, they'll have to draw down before they run out of space, even with the extraordinary measures. It, it, it shouldn't get to the point where you're a week, a month, or days away from hitting the debt ceiling. As you said in your opening, John, these are not new expenses. It's paying bills that have already been incurred. The United States ought to do that on a routine basis. I want to get to the cost and making this concrete for people. But before we get to that, as a day-to-day -day measure, how much of the brain share of the Treasury Department is occupied with this question? And how much of that brain share could be used to kind of do what the rest of your job is? Well, it, it, it takes an awful lot of your attention when you're in the season uh, that began these last few days. Uh, you watch every day uh, what the expenditures are, what you expect the incoming revenue to be. Um, it's highly consequential, and one of the things you worry about as Treasury Secretary is something happening accidentally. Mm -hmm. Revenues are a little lower than you expect. Expenditures are a little higher than you expect. Congress doesn't move so quickly. Congress always tries to figure out the last possible minute to act, right. and the danger is they go over that line. And they're playing with devices now that they say you can manage uh, if we hit this debt ceiling. Just to be clear, all of those devices are default of one kind or another. It's just a question of which bills you don't pay. So help people understand what that means to default. I mean, because I think a lot of people, we live in an age of hyperbole, and everything is on fire all the time, and so people just don't pay attention. But this is something where 
uh, their real stakes and help people understand what those stakes are. So, you know, the, the federal government pays for all kinds of things from uh, the, the school lunches that kids eat to the air traffic control systems that prevented the accident uh, at the airport that you reported on earlier. Um, it pays to keep the lights on in federal buildings. Um, you know, it pays soldiers, it pays Social Security, it pays Medicare. It is completely uh, pervasive in the economy, and it would disrupt all kinds of activities if the federal government failed to pay its bills. Um, more than just disrupting activity, it would create a sense that the federal government may not always pay its bills. When you're the definition of risk-free investment in federal bonds, risk-free partner to do business with, adding risk changes the terms. And what does that mean for the broader economy? So the, the last time this got close, um, you know, the cost of borrowing went up, yeah. people got out of stocks. I mean, help us understand the ripple effects in the larger yeah, the, economy. The last time we got, uh, the last two times, we got way too close. We saw interest rates spike, you know, uh, 50 to 100 basis points. We saw um, uh, major asset managers just dump all of their federal uh, holdings that would have matured in the window that was uncertain. Um, we're in a time now that's different than either 2011 or 2013. You know, we're coming out of the pandemic economy. We're coming out of massive you know, uh, monetary and fiscal policies. Um, there have been some kind of bumpy days in Treasury markets just because of the situation after the pandemic. If we introduce into that situation the added anxiety of will the federal government pay or not, we don't really know what the reaction is. It's a dangerous experiment to run. And it's an experiment that, as you were saying, the date, so there is the X date, which I gather is the date where that Social Security check doesn't start getting it, paid. It, yeah, it's when you really run out of uh, the things you can uh, shuffle around. And, and, and even, you don't have to reach that date for these, some of these things to kick in, yeah. right, in terms of the effects. Well, investors anticipate uh, everything. Uh, so if, uh, if, the, the, if there's an anticipation that the federal government may not uh, pay its bonds back on time on you know, a certain day or in a certain month, that could affect the markets for those uh, securities. They could trickle through in interest rates through the economy. In 2013, as I remember the history, and remind me of this, there was a there was a debt ceiling fight in 2011, and then there was another one in 2013. Yeah. And as I recall it, President Obama in 2013 said, "We're not going to play this game anymore." Yeah. That that in the House, Republicans tried to use, as Kevin McCarthy and his Republicans have promised they will, use the debt ceiling increase as a way to say we want future promises about spending reductions. Right. And President Obama said, and you said, no. Well, we had, a, we had a, a, a terrifying experience in 2011. We came so perilously close to defaulting that we were up all night watching Asian markets and to see whether the world thought we were there already. Um, we negotiated you know, to try to reach an agreement substantively, could not reach an agreement substantively. We ended up with a procedural solution. You might remember sequestration. It was a terrible thing that came out of that, which was across the board cuts that didn't make any policy sense. But it was enough to avoid defaulting, which made it the better alternative given the choices we had. That doesn't necessarily work. Sequestration was about as bad as something that you could put together that would get you through a crisis like that. What if you can't get through the crisis? You're dealing with people who are making arguments that are different than we heard in the 1980s or even the 1990s. We're hearing that it might be okay to default. Right. You can't negotiate with people when they say it's okay to default. That's a kind of extortion. It's a kind of threatening to burn the house down that is not really uh, acceptable. And it could lead to a miscalculation and a real default. So how does this get solved? Well, it's going to have to get solved. It's going to have to get solved the way it always has gotten solved, which is Congress is going to have to vote. And I believe that if this were put up for a vote, Congress would again find a way to vote for legislation that would permit the United States to pay the bills it's already incurred. The problem is you're now in a situation where the agreements that the Speaker has made um, have tied his hands in terms of what he will and won't bring to the floor. And there's now talk about the need to possibly have it come to the floor through a very unorthodox approach, which is 
you know, something that doesn't happen very often, where members sign a petition called a discharge petition to bring something to the floor instead of having a leadership bring it forward through the regular order. That would mean that some Republicans would have to join all the Democrats to do that. So the political work ahead is very hard. The consequences of failure are unthinkable. Jack Lou, thank you so much for being with us. Good to be with you, John.